You know, everything isn't always what you think it is. I'd like to tell you a little story about the hospital. Many of you are aware that at least 125,000 deaths a year occur because of iatrogenic disease. Disease brought about by either errors in doctors' prescriptions or from the prescriptions themselves for non-terminal illnesses. In fact, iatrogenic disease is the third major cause of death in the United States. Right behind heart disease and cancer comes iatrogenic disease. Now, they don't like to put that on the, the statistics when they publish them. But doctor-caused disease is the third major cause of death in the United States. And that's almost true anywhere where so-called allopathic medicine is uh, used as the major medicine of the country. And that should give us a little pause as to what we're going to choose when something goes wrong with us. You know, uh, you wake up in the morning and you got the sniffles, and the water is running, and the eyes are tearing, and uh, you got a cold. And uh, what do you do? Well, the first thing most of us think of is a decongestant, right? Something to dry us up. But you know, nature isn't so stupid. Why has nature turned on the faucet? Amen. To flush the junk out of there. To get rid of the bacteria or whatever it is. There are three major bacteria that can cause this uh, nasal congestion type of thing. I'm not talking necessarily about a cold now. And the moment that you dry up that flow of secretion, you are giving open house to those creatures that are in there causing the problem. So what we learn in newspapers and magazines and television advertising isn't always the best thing to do. I'm going to offer you here a couple of three alternatives to some very common conditions that may affect you. We're going to start out talking about <coughs> oxygen. We all too often take oxygen for granted. Now I could take this lady out in the desert and I could leave her without food for 60 days and she'd still be alive. Now she might be approaching blindness, but she'd still be alive. We could leave her without water for three days and she might still be alive, she'd be pretty dehydrated, but somewhere around the fourth day, she'd probably expire. But if I just take three minutes and do this, the lights go out. Because we... <laughs> it's okay, Anna. It's okay. <laughs> just three minutes shutting off the carotid artery, supply of oxygen to the brain, and the lights go out forever. Oxygen, something that we maybe should consider a little more seriously than we do. Oxygen is the single most important of all ingredients necessary for life. She can be on a diet totally without vitamin C for 180 days, six months, and she really won't have any symptoms. After six months, the symptoms of scurvy begin to show up. So we get all concerned. I mean, everybody takes vitamin C, right? But who worries about their oxygen? For which you can only be without for three minutes. Consider yourself. Just what does oxygen do to the body? Well, number one, it helps create energy. Oxygen as O2 that is in the air around us combines with glucose and creates energy. That energy is necessary for every single cellular function in your body. So that's very important. 
What most of us don't consider too much is the fact that oxygen also plays a great role in detoxification. In fact, I consider a form of oxygen, which we'll talk about, the single most effective detoxifier known to man. Better than any fasting program, better than any herb detoxification program. Oxygen can detoxify your body painlessly and the way the body is really designed to detoxify. And also, a certain form of oxygen kills anaerobic organisms. What are anaerobic organisms? You have aerobic organisms and you have anaerobic organisms. They're all around us. We have aerobic organisms in our gut to protect us. We call those friendly bacteria. You've heard of those. But those are aerobic. Those are oxygen loving. It's the anaerobic ones that are deadly to us, that are bad for us. That's right. Looking to suck the life right out of you. Yes. Anaerobes. They don't like oxygen. In fact, they can't stand oxygen. And a certain form of oxygen, just like that, can destroy an anaerobic bacteria, a virus, a fungus. So that's the importance, perhaps, maybe slightly overemphasized, but I don't think so. Title of our lecture, Oral Oxygen Supplementation, Stabilized Oxygen in Everyday Use, or, and here is the important thing, O1 therapy. Everybody knows oxygen is O2. But O1 is really elemental or atomic oxygen. O2 is a conglomeration of two atomic oxygens. It's the O2 that combines with glucose to create energy. But O1 has a very, very important part in our daily life. As a source of oral oxygen, we use hydrogen peroxide. It is a very simple compound. You will look at it. H2O2. Two hydrogens and two oxygens. This is a substance that I totally discarded when I first heard about it. The first lecture I heard on hydrogen peroxide, I had turned off the brain and just said, can't be, can't work, no good, impossible doesn't make sense. And that was about nine months. I never thought of it again. And then my wife was with me at a conference and she listened to a lecture. I didn't even bother going to hear the lecture on peroxide. And as we were driving home that night, she says, you know, honey, I'm going to start using hydrogen peroxide. What? So I'm going to start using, what do you mean? That's baloney. That's crap. That, that, that's nothing. That's phony baloney. He says, well, maybe, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know how, lady. <laughs> yeah. So I says, I'm going to get the, the, the skinny on this, and I'm going to show you that maybe it's even harmful. I was trying to scare her. I didn't know that it could be, you know, male chauvinistic attitude. So I called up a Walter Groves who had been doing most of the lecturing. And I said, Mr. Groves, uh, my name is Dr. Donsbaugh, and I would like you to send me all the material you have on hydrogen peroxide. And about three days later, I got a shoebox full of literature. And I started going through it. And that was the beginning of a grand jury journey for me. I mean, I've had so much fun around the world talking about oxygen therapy. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, we started doing the first intravenous oxygen or hydrogen peroxide infusions. Uh, 
just did a lot of things. Got interested in ozone, which is another form. Ozone turns into hydrogen peroxide. And you end up, as we'll soon see, with the same uh, molecule that we're really interested in. But the thing that really convinced me was something so simple. I had never been taught it in school. But it's so simple, but it really grabbed me. You see, in that literature was an explanation of how hydrogen peroxide was used in the body and was actually manufactured in the body. Now in the body, you have, we all know and recognize the immune system, right? Immune system is our army to defend us. And a part of that immune system is called a macrophage. And if you've studied any physiology, you'll recognize the macrophage is one of the real big members, very slow moving, and he comes up to uh, an offending cell or organism, and he kind of flows around it and gobbles it up. The thing that really got me was that inside the macrophage was a little manufacturing plant called a peroxisome. And the peroxisome makes what? hydrogen peroxide. And when the macrophage gets close to this offending organism, goes zap! <laughs> and it zaps that organism with hydrogen peroxide, which contains an oxygen molecule, an atomic oxygen, that cuts the cell wall, and it collapses, and then it consumes it. Said, wow, maybe I can do that from the outside and help a failing immune system. And goodness knows we've got enough things in our diet today that depress the immune system. So that was how I got involved with hydrogen peroxide. And as I say, it's been a fantastic ride. I've loved every minute of it. We've talked on this subject in practically every country in the world and uh, just had a lot of great response. Now, why should we consider oral oxygen necessary? Isn't the natural way to get oxygen into our body through the nose, the lungs, into the bloodstream? Yes, it certainly is. But, look at this. Your hemoglobin may be so bound with carbon monoxide that it can't pick up the oxygen we need. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. And secondly, because by releasing O1, we do so many things to clean up the toxins and creatures in our bloodstream and body, and the only way we can get O1 directly into the bloodstream is by taking it orally through the stomach and from the stomach directly into the bloodstream. And I'll, I want you to remember that. You don't absorb hydrogen peroxide from the intestinal tract. You have to absorb it either sublingually or directly from the stomach. So you need an empty stomach. We'll talk more about that. But those are the reasons why we need to take oral oxygen as compared to sucking oxygen, which has, over the years, been found to not be very effective in doing what you usually want to get. Uh, they've done many, many tests on uh, people like football players, basketball players who get winded out there on the field, and they set them down and they give them an oxygen mask, and then they'll check them and see how their energy level is as compared to the guy who's just <laughs> doing that. And there's practically no difference in the one sucking oxygen, the one just sucking air, because the lungs can only transmit so much oxygen to the hemoglobin, and you can get as much as you're going to get most of the time, particularly if you're healthy uh, from normal breathing. But we're not trying to get more O2, really. As you will see, we're going to look, really, at this O1 that occurs. I'd also like to bring to your attention that 300 years ago, the oxygen level in our atmosphere was 30% at sea level. 
Today, it's 19%. We are losing oxygen in our environment at the rate of one half percent every 10 years. And that is uh, potentially serious. In 10 years, we'll have 18 and a half percent oxygen in our environment. In 20 years, we'll have 18, I mean, it is potentially very bad if it continues at the rate we're going. And the reason we're losing that oxygen is our industrialization. Now, there's got to be uh, some way of offsetting that. Now, science would theorize that adaptation would come into play. Either the lung capacity should increase, in other words, man should, uh, by losing a third of his oxygen, should get bigger lungs so he can breathe deeper, or lung extraction of oxygen should become more efficient. But neither of that is happening. Unfortunately, actually the reverse is happening. You know, years ago, everybody didn't have an automobile. And years ago, Mama used to walk down to the grocery store once a day, maybe once every other day, and get fresh milk and fresh bread and things of that nature, and walk back to the house. Today, she gets in her Ford or Chevy, and she drives down to the supermarket, and she drives round and round until she gets a parking place right in front. Touche. And park. Touche. Yes. And then she gets a cart. She don't want to carry this stuff. She gets a cart. And she pushes it around, and then checks out, puts it in the car, and then drives the car into the garage, which is right next to the kitchen. So she has very little exercise involved. Mr. Husband gets in his car in the morning, drives to the office, and sit up, sits down all day, Maybe gets up to get a cup of coffee once or twice in the morning and afternoon. But literally does nothing, comes home in the evening, flops down on the tarp of the uh, couch and uh, says, oh, I'm so tired, and watches television and goes to sleep munching on potato chips. <laughs> that really helps you get lung capacity, doesn't it? I'm going to prove a point here. I want you to all put your feet flat on the floor. Put your hands in your laps. I'm going to count to three. I want you to take the deepest breath you have taken in the year 2001 on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, you can let it out. How old are you, ma'am? 50 years old. Do you think in 50 years you should have learned how to breathe? <laughs> you all believe, better believe that. You're not doing such a good job. And 90% of the other people in this room weren't doing such a great job either. I'm going to tell you why. What did I see? I saw you do this. One. Two, three. Now, rooster does that when he starts to crow. But a human being doesn't have his lungs the same way as a rooster does. Man's lungs are triangular shaped, and the smallest point is up here. And the base of the lungs are way down here. Now, if any of you have ever attended a yoga class, you've heard the yoga instructor say, when you breathe, I want you to breathe down to your toes, all the way down. Now, I don't know what happens to us humans as we age, but if you ever watch a baby, you'll never see a baby going, <laughs> What do you see? He's using the base of his lungs. He's creating lung capacity. Now a lot of you think that 
I've got a little extra Amber Dupoy here. <laughs> You're mistaken. This is lung capacity because I know how to do it. <laughs> you buy that one, I'll sell your ribs. <laughs> but seriously, there was a book written about breathing by a physician who said, I reduced my prescriptions by 60% by teaching my patients how to breathe. Think about it. Now, for those of you who really have problem breathing, I'm going to give you a simple exercise that you can do anytime you want. Go up to your couch, lie in front of it with your rear end right up against the couch, your upper legs like this, and your knees right on the couch. Got the picture? Okay. Your butt's right up against the couch, legs up, knees over, resting. It is impossible in that position to breathe with your upper part of your lungs. Prove me wrong. Try it sometime. You can lie there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes a day, and it might surprise you what it does for your energy level. Just simple little 10 or 15 minute period, breathing properly, getting rid of some of the excess gases you don't need in your lungs, and filling it up with fresh oxygen. Try it, please. It does work. Simple, very simple. Let's talk about O1 and O2. Elemental oxygen is made up of a single O, single oxygen. It is referred to as singlet oxygen or atomic oxygen or also free oxygen. This is very, very active and has a short life of about one five thousandth of a second. I can conceive of one five thousandth of a second. One second is short enough for me. But one five thousandth of a second. Whatever it's going to do, it has to do just that fast. It is therefore unstable. On the other hand, O2 is called stable oxygen. It's merely two O1s hooked together. And it is very stable and is difficult to tear down again into its com uh, uh, component parts. And so it's, uh, it, from a chemical uh, analysis, it is a very, very stable molecule. We know a lot about this. Most of what we're going to talk about tonight, however, is this unstable, very, very short-lived O1 molecule. There is an enzyme in all humans and most animals called catalase. Catalase is used for a variety of different reasons, but one of its major purposes in our uh, use of oral oxygen is to break down hydrogen peroxide into two components. H2O, everybody recognizes water, plus O1. Now the moment that it, the hydrogen peroxide leaves the stomach and goes into the bloodstream, it is immediately cut by catalase, and you release water here, and O1 over here. So uh, that's how it breaks down. And, but this happens immediately, so you don't have the possibility of, as many people say, of toxic reactions from uh, hydrogen peroxide just won't happen because this breaks down into water and O1 so quickly, and the O1 is gone in one five thousandth of a second. Now, it has either destroyed a bacteria in that one five thousandth of a second, or a virus, or a fungus, or it has joined another O1 to form O2. So potentially you're getting two benefits. You're getting a cleaning up of the bloodstream, and after you've got cleaning up done, then you're going to have more oxygen actually present in the bloodstream. 
Just to review here for a moment, oxygen as O2 has one major function to combine with glucose and create a energy uh, molecule called ATP. Uh, chemically, that's adenosine triphosphate. That's the energy currency in the human body. That's what makes us run. If you don't have energy, you don't have life. Oxygen as O1 has two functions. One, to detoxify. And it does this through what we call the oxidation reduction method. And that's when the O1 quickly attaches itself to something. Um, you can uh, think of, uh, let's uh, think of um, iron. Let's put a bar of iron on a window ledge outside uh, the window and leave it there for three days. What will you see at the end of three days usually on the outside of that iron bar? Rust. What is rust? The side effect of oxidation of iron. In fact, that rust is called iron oxide. A gas, oxygen, was able to take iron, a terribly hard, firm component, metal, and literally turn it into a crumbly mass by combining them. That's what we refer to when we talk about oxidation reduction. You're reducing iron to iron oxide. And you can do that with bacteria and with uh, uh, the side effects of metabolism, many of which are toxic to the body, and we have to get rid of them. And you use oxidation to make them less harmful in the body. At the same time, that O1 destroys the anaerobic bacteria that we talked about, the viruses, the fungi, as well as weak or unusual cells. And if we can get this O1 to, as an example, a cancer cell, we can destroy the cancer cell with the O1. But I'm not going to get too far into that. O1 can and will destroy any offending cell or organism or in the absence of such a join with another O1 to form O2. And all of this will occur within just a very, very short period of time. I can talk about, well I will in a moment, how you can create energy with the O1, not with the O2, uh, because there's some other secrets here that a lot of people haven't talked about when they talk about uh, oxygen therapy. You see an O1 here just actually cutting the wall of a weakened cell, and that will deflate just like a balloon that you cut the wall of a balloon and the cell will be destroyed. Now, you might at that point say, well, how does it distinguish between a weak cell and a strong cell? A strong cell in the human body has an outer cover, uh, almost the consistency of chitin, which prevents O1 from getting in there to the inner uh, wall and cutting it. So it will reject it. Disease will end up affecting you in your genetically weakest place. That's why some people have arthritis and other people never have a touch of it. <clears throat> Charles Farr was one of the physicians who, after I did the first IV hydrogen peroxide, picked up on the idea and really uh, took it quite a ways and in fact started a association of physicians in the United States uh, of doctors who were using hydrogen peroxide intravenously. He says, I treat the following conditions with intravenous oxygen every day with excellent results. Acute and chronic infections, that's where the anaerobes come in, angina, asthma, arrhythmias, that's heart problems, cancer, emphysema, lung problems, influenza, flu, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammation of the arteries. Uh, 
Dr. Farr unfortunately has passed on, but his organization lives after him and uh, is uh, holding two seminars a year on the new therapies that are coming out all the time, new uses of oxygen. Other researchers. What's the name of his organization? Write this down. One, six, one, nine, four, seven, five, nine, nine, six, one. Fax me the question. I'll give you the name of the or I'm sorry. I, uh, it's something about. trying to think it's like biooxy uh, bioactive I'm sorry it's life-giving oxygen therapies is kind of what it means I'll be happy to give you telephone number and everything his wife is still running the organization these are some very reputable people and I've been in hundreds literally of hospitals who do research in oxygen therapy, even though it isn't widely used. I've been in Russia that has uh, a whole university, literally, dedicated to nothing but ozone therapy, uh, which does literally the same thing as what we've been talking about. Cures ventricular fibrillation. Dr. Urschel published the study in the journal Circulation. Removes arterial plaque officially, Baylor University put hydrogen peroxide directly in the arteries and found that for a space of about 20 inches you removed all of the plaque that was on the arteries. Better than a hyperbaric chamber also by Baylor University. You might say, well gosh, with that kind of research and everything, why isn't it popular? Why isn't everybody doing it? Anybody want to answer that question? You guys are too smart. <laughs> no, not necessarily anything that works. They don't want it. It's just that you can't get any real money for it. You can't. It, it's too common. I mean, you can do it yourself. You don't need to go to a doctor. So it, it just, uh, they'll criticize anything that uh, takes away from them. They're, Believe me, they're business people par excellence. <clears throat> now, I've got, I think, no, I don't. Lou, do you have a dollar you can loan me? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to give a dollar to somebody who can tell me the substance that is absorbed directly from the stomach into the blood stream and not from the small intestine. All food stuffs is absorbed from the small intestine. There are two things that are absorbed directly from the stomach into the bloodstream. For one dollar, what is the second one? Hydrogen peroxide is Chlorine one. Dioxide. What? Chlorine dioxide. No, no. Sulfuric so acid. Lou, you got to give this lady one dollar. Okay, right here. What did she say? Alcohol. Grandma told you. Alcohol. Don't drink on an empty stomach. You'll get drunk too quick. Right? Most of you know, I saw on TV the other night, they took three guys and they gave one guy a little meal, one guy a big meal, and one guy no meal. And they, text, they both drank exactly the same amounts of alcohol. The guy who didn't drink had a much higher level of alcohol didn't in his eat. bloodstream after drinking <laughs> than the one, did I say, the one that did not eat. Yes. And the one that ate a little bit, had a little bit higher or lower. And the one who ate a big meal, he had the lowest level. So alcohol is inhibited by food in the stomach. Hydrogen peroxide actually almost disappears. You'll get no benefit. It isn't that it hurts you to take it with food. It's just that you're not going to get the benefit. So if you're going to take hydrogen peroxide orally, take it on an empty stomach. There are three ways of getting hydrogen peroxide in. 
Number one, we have a liquid that's combined with colloidal silver. You take that either on arising and at bedtime, or a half an hour before each meal. Or if you are a little bit more convenience oriented, we have capsules. You can take capsules a half an hour before each meal. Or if you're like most of us and can't remember anything, yeah. you carry around this little jar. Do you all get that little uh, thing? Where is one? Huh? You got one there? You're going to get a buck anyway. <laughs> all right. All you do with this is just pop a few drops under the tongue, leave it there, it'll absorb, right? into your bloodstream directly. And I don't care if you just ate five minutes ago. This is here. The absorption is here. This is a concentrated thing. Now, it doesn't taste bad, but about five to 10 seconds after you take it, you can taste the peroxide. It isn't a bad taste, but you can taste it. So you know it's there. We're not just giving you some water. So those are the three ways of using this, okay? Thank you very much. But you don't want to use them in before going to bed because they're going to get energy from it. Well, the amount that uh, you normally would consume is not going to keep you awake. Uh, I can, uh, you know, I've had people take as much as a quart a day of the concentrated oxygen with colloidal silver. And in fact, I was lecturing right here on this road at the Radisson Hotel one evening to a group of people. And after the lecture was over, this guy came up to me and he hugged me and he said, Dr. D, I can't thank you enough. And I said, what did I do? And he says, well, you cured me. He said, I read your booklet on oxygen. And I'm a car dealer, he said, over in Las Vegas, Nevada. And he says, I, I got what everybody diagnosed as a chronic fatigue syndrome. And I got so I could only deal maybe two hours a day, and the rest of the time I was down flat. I was in bed. I felt so bad, and I just felt life wasn't worth living anymore. And he said, I accidentally went into a health food store one day and uh, saw your accidentally, yes. And I saw your booklet on oxygen, the head on the, the thing there, candidiasis, chronic fatigue syndrome. He says, I, I picked it up and I read it, and I thought, what the heck, I'll try buying a bottle of that. He said, I looked at the directions, said, take a tablespoon morning and night, and I said, you know, I'm pretty sick, I'm gonna take two tablespoons more and night, nothing happened. And he says, well, I've got this bottle, I might as well, really see if it's going to do anything. So two tablespoons of one ounce. So he took two ounces three times a day. That's six ounces a day. And he says, you know, I started feeling better. And he said, what the heck? He went down and he bought a case of them. <laughs> Twelve bottles. And he took a full bottle, 32 ounces, every day, 12 days. And he says, at the end of 12 days, I was totally cured, and I've never reverted back to the chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, I don't tell you that to encourage all of you to take a bottle a day. I'm not hmm. here to do that. I'm only here to tell you this is a perfectly safe substance, and proper usage can really surprise you. You don't have to worry about overdoing it. The only thing you need to worry if you're taking that liquid is that you do it on an empty stomach. That's where you're going to get your most benefit. I would like to warn you, I'll get to question in just a moment. There are some other forms of peroxide out there. Hydrogen peroxide is 94% oxygen. There is another substance out there called chlorine dioxide or chlorine peroxide. I'm going to warn you about that because what you are really buying is Clorox. Now they will tell you that it is not. 
I'm going to ask you to do the thumb finger test. I want you to put a drop of this stuff on your forefinger, rub it with your thumb, and smell it. And if you don't know what it is, then you haven't ever done any laundry. <laughs> the smell of Clorox is unmistakable. And they tell you, oh no, it's Clorox of sodium baloney, my dear friends. I'm sorry, you're buying very high-priced Clorox. Clorox taken in the human body, the chlorine that is the waste product of the breakdown of this, which breaks down into chlorine and O1. And the O1 will benefit you, but the chlorine is a precancerous substance and you don't want to take it into your body. It cause all kinds of problems. If you're using that substance now, that's fine, it's your decision, but now you know what it is that you're taking. Magnesium peroxide is a good form, but it's about five times as expensive as hydrogen peroxide, and it only breaks down to hydrogen peroxide anyway in the stomach, uh, so you're getting basically hydrogen peroxide. For those of you who are interested, here are three books that I would like to suggest you may consider if you want some more real good information about oxygen therapy. The newest one is this Oxygen and Aging by Dr. Ali. And he has got probably the most in-depth expose of what oxygen, hydrogen peroxide therapy, both oral and intravenous, will do for you. And bathing in it and so forth, all of which we do of any of these, uh, any of the people. He's done a fabulous, fabulous job. Uh, that's number one. Oxygen Therapy, A New Way of Approaching Disease by Ed McCabe is a kind of a standard. Uh, a lot of great work in there. Uh, very good author, etc. And then Oxygen <laughs> Healing Therapies by Nathaniel Altman uh, is another a very, very good uh, book about basic oxygen therapy. 